Well, good morning, everybody. Sure feels better in here than it does outside, isn't that the truth? It lets us know how, how blessed we are because we came in here during the winter and we were glad that it was warm. Now we came in here and we're glad it's cool. Um, I have to tell you, I am very grateful go, to go to heaven for a lot of reasons, but the, this heat is enough for me. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I have to share with you, Heather, I can't see where you are, but I think you're over there, that I loved your line. I want to make sure I got this correct, okay? Um, never be a prisoner of the past. That's a time of lesson or that's a lesson, not a life sentence. Wow. That's worth pondering a little bit, isn't it? Because who holds the past sometimes against us? Well, the evil one does. We can count on that. He wants to always drag us down rather than us accept the freedom that Christ has promised us and the redemption that Christ has pressed us down. But who else is one of our biggest foes? It's not just the evil one. Who else is one of the biggest foes? Ourselves. Isn't that true? And I love that when we talk about the things and we sing about the things we sang today, we recognize that we need the Lord. It's the Lord who we need. We can't overcome things on our own. And I'm glad that we said, you are my Lord in that song, because it can't just be the Lord. He is the Lord. But when he's your Lord, when he's my Lord, it sure, sure makes a difference. And there's no doubt about that. And the things we'll be talking about today, we're going to be seeing things like this, I believe, more and more in the future. And yet they happened thousands of years ago, too. The title of today is Say No to Oh No. And when you say, say, oh, no, oh, no, what are you talking about? Well, oh, no was a place. You'll see it in just a few moments when we dig into Nehemiah chapter 6. But you know what? There's a lot of things in this world we need to say no to. There's a lot of things we need to say yes to. And having Jesus be your Savior and recognize that he can set you free and you don't have to carry yesterday's burdens with you. In fact, he tells you just the opposite. He said, be free. Be a new person. Have new life. You want to have life in your life. You want you to have joy. You want you to have peace. You want you to have purpose. He doesn't want you to be, be chained to yesterday's battles. Yesterday's battles are behind us, and we're to live and walk in newness of life. So I'm real excited to be able to share with you what we're going to be talking about. But I'll be the first to say that as I worked on this particular sermon, and I work on them for a long time, whether they sound like it or not, I do work on them for a long time, I can share with you this. I thought about a lot of things in my own life that I needed to hear. And I asked myself a lot of questions. So any of the questions you hear that I may ask you, be assured I've asked them myself a whole bunch of times because how can I dare get up here and ask you personal questions and sometimes hard questions without looking to my own heart and asking the Lord to not just reveal to me what I need to learn, but to do what he's called me to do. It's so easy to say I'm going to do this and say I'm going to do that and everything else. It's a whole other thing to do it. And let me tell you something that's even more important than doing. Being. Being is more important. Doing can be a one-time thing or a two-time thing. Being is something that's transformational. Being is something that is, is a whole different story. And when we get to heaven, I believe we're going to be really a lot more saying, this is our home if we've really gotten close to God when we've had the opportunity to be here on earth. So there's a lot in this particular passage, a lot in this particular passage. It tells us about what people are going to try to do and mess up Nehemiah. also tells you about some of the things that people do to try to mess up um, other people. And it tells us, too, uh, how we need to be protected from some of the same battles that are going on now that went on thousands and thousands of years ago. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll go to Nehemiah chapter 6. We're going to hop around a little bit. We're going to primarily be in Nehemiah chapter 6. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are a great God. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that you inhabit the praises of your people. And Father, it's a praise to know that a big group of our people today went out early in the morning to go on a mission trip. They gathered together at 3 o'clock, and then they got in a bus that drove them for, uh, all the way up to Philadelphia. And now they're going to fly from there, Lord. Father, we pray, Lord, that they just would really feel your power, your peace, your comfort, your strength. Stretch them and grow them in every way. May the people who they come in contact know that they are different than what they could be because they choose to serve you. And when we serve people in your name, Lord, it doesn't just encourage them, it changes us. May we have a servant's heart. May we have a, a soft heart in a hard world. May we speak words of love and light rather than words that are harsh and hard. Father, we, we live in a world where people see how much they can hurt each other sometimes. Lord, that's just the opposite of what you've told us to do and be. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would remember that every word that's in the Bible has been placed here for a reason. And Father, may we not only learn what that reason is today, but may we make the choices that are necessary to not just have intelligence, 
but they'll be wise. Father, it certainly seems to me like the wisdom of this world is fading away faster and faster. Father, we are grateful for all the intellect. We're grateful for all the different things that have come about that we never would have thought with technology and medicine and so many other things. But Lord, how we need a whole lot more wisdom. And Father, we know, Lord, that wisdom comes from above. So be with us, Lord. Help us to really put the world behind us and open up our hearts to what you say. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stephanie always says to me, you have a lot of interest in things that most people don't have an interest in. I think that's true. I like to watch debates. I like to read articles that are about people because anything that affects people I have an interest in for sure. And one of the things I do know is that when you hear certain phrases, they sort of stay in your head, or at least they stay in my head. There's an old English phrase that goes like this, when all is said and done. I've heard that for years, when all is said and done. And I don't know about you, when I hear the words, when all is said and done, I think to myself, when all is said and done, what? What? happens when all is said and done. Isn't it fair and accurate to say, if we try to answer that question, that when all is said and done, a whole lot more is said than actually done. That's true, isn't it? It's so easy to talk about something when it comes to taking action and not take action. It's so very tempting to convince ourselves if we talk about something, if we're sure about something, that that's something that we're doing. But that's not the same thing as taking action. But deep in our hearts, we all know better than the things sometimes the world tells us, the evil one tells us, and we tell ourselves. When I was a boy, my father would always give me sayings. If any of you know him, he's still alive. He's almost 91 years old, and he's still the king of sayings. There's no doubt about it. And I was just thinking about one of his sayings today when I was working a little more on the sermon. And he said to me these words. He said, son, always remember, the bigger the band, the smaller the show. What? The bigger the band is, the smaller the show. What does that mean? Well, what he was trying to teach me is that those who regularly feel the need to talk about how much they are engaged, how active they are, and how driven they are, tend to do what most of the time? The least. Because there's something different than just saying things than what it is actually doing things. Do you agree that when all is said and done, far much more is said than is done? Yet when we read about this particular man who lived thousands of years ago, left a very posh lifestyle to go and have nothing but challenges come his way, what do we see? We see those words don't fit Nehemiah. What do we see when we study the life of Nehemiah? We see that he was faithful. What else do we see? We see he was stable. What else do we see? He was a consistent follower of God. He stayed with God through the process, whether it was easy or whether it was hard. Nehemiah was not only a person of thought, but Nehemiah was a person of prayer. He was a person of action. He was a person of, of sacrifice. And he made a great difference in this world in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we move into chapter 6 of the book of Nehemiah, the wall of Jerusalem has been built. Many of the people who were with him helped restore the wall, and it was rebuilt. The only thing that was left to do was to hang up the doors. The project was nearly completed. One would think at this particular point that all those different people who had tried to slow him down or criticize him would cease, but that didn't happen. There was still an entrance point, an opening, and that's all it took for the evil one who opposed the work to go on the attack. Make no mistake about it. If you're a Christian, you will be under attack because the evil one does want to try to bring us down and we need to be aware of that and take that truth and put it in our hearts because it is true. And when I ponder what took place with, with Nehemiah, when I ponder what takes place still in the world that we live in today, I think about a passage of scripture I want you to see. So keep your finger in Nehemiah, but go with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter four. Paul is speaking now, speaking to a church, speaking to a church that's challenged. And he says these words in, Nehemiah, excuse me, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. He's giving a warning. And what's the warning say? He says, in your anger, he's being real personal, in your anger, do not sin. Now, let's stop there just for a moment. Is there such thing as righteous anger? Yes, there is. Jesus showed some righteous anger when he was here. There is such thing as righteous anger, but who among us doesn't know there's a whole lot more unrighteous anger that's in this world, and sometimes the unrighteous anger that comes our way is sent by other people, and sometimes we send it to others, and we also send it to ourselves, but that's not where the verse stops. Look what happens after that. It says, do not let the sun go down where you were still angry. He said, don't just keep on carrying an anger spirit. It's not going to do you any good. I've never seen unholy anger help anybody, but I've sure seen it hurt a lot of different people. But what's the main reason? He says that we need to be careful about this. Well, look how the verse continues. And do not give the devil a foothold. 
Don't give the devil an opening. There's a word picture here that Paul uses. He's saying, in essence, picture yourself being pursued by those who oppose you, and you're trying to close the door so that they can't get to you, and just before you're able to close the door, they put their foot in the door so that you can't close it. Have you ever tried to open or shut a door when someone's foot been in there? A foothold is a very powerful force. Footholds, even the smallest of footholds, can not only be dangerous, they can be very dangerous. That's why when the Apostle speaks about this in the book of Ephesians in verse 26, what's he referring to? He's referring to unholy anger. Unholy anger gives birth to a lot of sin. The evil one loves when we have unholy anger and believe me, when we give him that opportunity, he loves it and he's glad to take it. Please know that when we choose to express unholy anger, it doesn't help anyone at all. Have you ever seen anybody share unholy anger with anybody and see any good come of it at all? Well, I haven't. In fact, just the opposite takes place. When a person is sharing unholy anger, what happens? There's a whole lot more pain going on. And what else is happening? Other people are feeling more pain. And what's happening inside of you, whether you recognize it or not, is hardening your own heart. I say to the Lord almost every day, I'm, looks like a good day for you to come back to me. I say to the Lord almost every day, Lord, help me to love people with your kind of love, not just with the love that I would have. And I pray almost every day, Lord, keep my heart soft in a hard, hard world. When you have a hard heart and you say unholy words, what does it do? It talks about taking a huge toll. It's a tragedy. It's a terrible way to live. Now, I want you to see something more because there's another foothold. Go with me, if you will, from there to Psalms chapter 141. Psalms chapter 141. You're going to see how this all correlates soon with Nehemiah. But look at Psalms 141 verse 3. David was praying. Isn't it cool that we get to hear not only what somebody's saying, what somebody's been told to write, but we actually hear what people who are prominent in the Bible, we got to hear some of their, their prayers. What did he pray? Look at it. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Wow. Wow. What's he talking about here? He's talking about unholy words. Be careful of unholy words. Be assured if you're sharing unholy words, the devil will see it as a foothold and he's glad to take it. This is such an important truth. I want to chase it just a little bit. Go with me, if you will, to, to Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. What are we talking about? We're talking about saying not only unholy anger, but now we're talking about saying unholy words. Words are a potent force. There's no doubt about that. They hurt us more than sticks and stones. We've talked about that before. But look what Proverbs 10, 19 says. When words are many, sin is not absent. That's the NIV. Some other translations say it this way. When words are many, sin is not afar off. But he or she who holds their tongue is wise. When I was a boy, I don't know if the world's still this way or not because they haven't been boy for a while. But when I was a boy, if you had glasses like mine, you know, that were so thick, I have 20, 1,000 in both eyes, or almost 1,000 in both eyes. But now I have rolled, polished, I have everything you can possibly have in, in my eyes. It's ridiculous. Remember, you wanted to borrow my glasses one time? You remember you looked through there and said, oh, my gracious, Louise. But when I was a kid, they were made out of glass. They weren't made out of plastic. If you're as old as me, you remember when you'd have prints on your nose and everything else when you wore big glasses like that. And, and I, I thought to myself, wow, I hate having glasses. But sometimes people who wore glasses, people thought were smart just because they wore glasses. It's sort of funny, isn't it? But who did we think was wise? Even when we were young, we thought people who were a little bit more quiet were wise. And maybe they are. And maybe we need to remember that ourselves. When words are many, Sin is not absent, but he or she who holds her tongue is wise. Now, if you think those words are strong, listen to the words of Jesus. Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Jesus is speaking here now. This is not coming from an apostle. This is not coming from a, a, anyone else other than the Lord himself. And he says these words in Luke 6, 45. The good man or the good person brings good things out of the good stored up in his or her heart. The evil man or person brings up evil things out of the evil that is stored in her heart. Now, why? Why is that possible? Look how the verse continues. For out of the overflow of what? Out of the overflow of his or her heart, his mouth 
speaks or her mouth speaks. When I think about that, I think about an old proverb. It's not a proverb you'll find in the Bible, but it's a proverb that I still think makes a tremendous amount of sense. Whatever a person is most filled up with comes out when they're bumped. Whatever a person is most filled up with comes out when they're bumped. We need to be careful. We need to be careful because we can speak words of life or we can speak words of death. What did we just finish saying? Jesus is giving a warning about being careful because when you say too many things, you're heading in a dangerous plight. But that's not all. That is, that's not the only thing that's shared by Jesus when it comes to word. So once you see one other thing, go with me to Matthew chapter 12. Again, the Lord is speaking. What's he talking about? He's talking about using unholy words. And in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and verse 7, 37, he says this. He says, but I tell you, He's being very plain about who's doing the talking. He's very, being very plain about who's the one who's speaking and why he's speaking the way that he is. But I tell you that men or people will have to give, there's no exceptions in this, will have to give what? Have to give an account on the day of judgment for what? For every careless word, not some careless words, not a few careless words, but every careless word they have spoken. For by your words, this is very personal, you, who, you, will be acquitted, and by your words, who, you, will be condemned. I read that and I think to myself, I need to watch my words. I need to make sure that I'm sharing words that are a blessing, sharing words that are kind, because unholy words can take people down, not just the ones who hear them, but also the ones who say them. Now look back with me at one more before we launch too much into the book of Nehemiah. You're going to see why in a moment. Psalms 141. Psalms 141. Look at verse 4. David again is praying. We get to read what he has to say. I really appreciate his openness. He says, let not my heart... Notice he didn't just say his mind or his emotions. He said, let not my heart be drawn away to what is evil, to take part in the wicked deeds with men who are evildoers. Let me not eat of their delicacies. Do you see the other foothold that's being mentioned? Not only is it a bad attitude, not only is it bad words, he's saying be real careful of unholy thoughts. Maybe you don't know all the thoughts that you're thinking, whether they're holy or not, but God does. God does. Be careful of unholy thoughts. What are you saying, Pastor Ron? I'm saying unholy thoughts will give the devil a foothold and make no mistake about it. He'll be very glad to take it. The Apostle Paul expounded on this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. He said, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought. Now, why is that so important? Why are we looking at that when we are in the book of Nehemiah? Well, I'll tell you why it's so important. Look at the next few words. To make it obedient to who? To make it obedient to Christ. Now, think with me about the things we've talked about thus far. Why is it so important that we take our thoughts captive? Well, let me answer that question for you. When we choose not to take every thought captive, some of those thoughts take us captive. Have you noticed that? We think we're catching other people. We think we're damaging other people. We think we're straightening other people. But what we're actually doing is we're indicting ourselves. It's taking us captive. When we choose not to take every thought captive, some of those thoughts tend to take us captive. That's why the Bible tells us in Philippians, when they're going through a very different, difficult time, it says, think on things that are good. Think on things or dwell on things that are holy. Time and again, the Bible tells us what? It tells us to guard our heart, for it is the wellspring within us. It's the thing that gives us life, real life, true life. Well, why did I share all that with you? Well, I'll, share it with, I'll tell you why. Nehemiah was about to face every single foothold we just finished talking about. Those who opposed him when he was trying to build the wall, they used unholy anger. We talked about that. Unholy words. And they were certainly driven by unholy thoughts. Well, what happened? What happened specifically? The first assault we see is in Nehemiah chapter 6. Let's look at verses 1 and the first part of verse 2. It says, when the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to this time I had not, seen the, I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. Now, I don't know if you're writing your Bible or not, but if you're writing your Bible, let me encourage you to underline two words right there. And the words meet together are very important. Meet together. 
You would think if you read those words that it would be really something kind to us doing. Let's meet together. When I say to somebody, I'd love to have coffee with you. I want to get together with them. I care about them. I want it to be a special time. Let's meet together. One would think when they read these words that this is suggesting they're going to have a very friendly visit. You would think, you know what, this is such an important thing that they said it to him how many different times? If you read the chapter, you see they said this thing four different times. On the surface, it was like they were saying, it's going to be great when we get together. On the surface, it's like they were saying, you did it. You did a project that we didn't ever think you could do. You were right and we were wrong. Sure, we had our disagreements, but that's all behind us now. Take a break for a little while. Let's get together. Come on up the beautiful, oh no, we're going to celebrate. We're going to have a great time together. Now, Nehemiah had anything other than a great time with them for a long time. How does he respond? Well, he's got some wisdom. How does he respond to their invitation to their bleeding? Look with me at the second part of verse 2 through verse 4. But they were what? They were scheming, it says in the NIV. They were intentionally devising a plan of attack. To do what? Look how the verses continue. To harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop? Well, I leave it and go down to you. Four times they sent me the same message and each time I gave them the same answer. Wow. There are two very important truths I see when I read this passage and I prayed about it that I felt like the Lord wanted me to share with you that are pressing. And the first one is this. The adversaries of Nehemiah were persistent. We hear that again? The adversaries of Nehemiah were persistent. And the second response that the Lord put in my heart to share with you is this. Nehemiah and his responses were consistent. What a good beginning. What a powerful end. What are you saying, Pastor? And I'm saying Nehemiah stood his ground, but he didn't stand his ground in his own strength. How did he stand his ground? He stood his ground in the power of God. If you're un- if you want to underline in your Bible, let me encourage you to underline the words, I am carrying on a great work and cannot go down. Please know this when you read those verses. Anytime you step out for God, the evil one doesn't like it. And he doesn't just not like it, he goes on the attack. Why are you stressing this so much? Well, I'll tell you why I'm stressing this so much. Spiritual warfare is exactly what the words imply. It is warfare, absolute warfare, spiritual warfare. And sometimes it comes without warning, or it can come in a disguise, and sometimes it can even seem like it's something good if you only look at the surface. Now, when I, look, when I think about that, I think of some more words of my dad. He was the word king and still is. And he used to tell me this too when I was growing up. He said, don't sacrifice what's best for what appears to be good. Don't sacrifice what's best for what appears to be good. What do you mean when you say that, Dad? Well, let me give you the rest of his words. He said, don't sacrifice what's best for what appears to be good. If you do so, the good is no longer good because you pay too high a price for it. Pretty wise, isn't it? Have you ever noticed certain things of sacrifice? Have you ever noticed that the hardest day of the week for most people to get out of their house get dressed and get into their car is Sunday, especially if they're making their way to church. There's no, they get up easier for work, they get up easier for this or that, but Sunday is such a battle. Have you ever noticed that it's a whole lot harder to read your Bible than it is to read a book? It's a lot easier to read a book, isn't it? Or to read an article, or to read words on your computer screen. Especially, it's a whole lot harder to read your Bible than read your latest text. Everybody wants to see that right away. Have you noticed that it's a whole lot easier to watch television or engage in social media than it is to spend time in the the name of the Lord or spend time with the Lord himself and minister to his people? On and on we could go, but the point is obvious. Spiritual warfare is real. It's very real. And every time we seek to step out for the name of the Lord, the evil one goes against our human spirit and other people sometimes go on the attack. And that should not surprise us because we are, if we are serving the Lord, whatever we are doing, like Nehemiah, is not just a good work, it's a great work. I love the title of the old hymn. It went like this, Every work for Jesus will be blessed. Nehemiah didn't know that song, but he was well aware of that biblical truth, and he refused. He absolutely refused to be sidetracked. He basically said what to the invitations that they kept sending him over and over and over again. He said no to or no. He said, I am not coming down. And that ought to be the response of every single Christian who wants to make his or her life found for the kingdom of God, especially when it comes to living out our faith and seeking to help other people in the name of Jesus. Now think about it this way. The Christian life is a whole lot more like a marathon than it is like a sprint. A marathon 
I never ran a marathon, but a marathon's 26 miles and 385 yards. I know Dan Hartman has run a marathon. Just thinking about it makes me tired. I'm told by those who run the marathons that the last 385 yards are the most difficult challenges of the entire race. Surely Nehemiah could relate to this truth. It must have been more than a little tempting for him to break down or at least take a break or at least let down, but he didn't yield at all. What did Nehemiah say when they were trying to slow him down? He said, I am carrying on a great project and I cannot or I will not go down. Let me ask you some questions I've been asking myself. How do you respond? This is what I say to myself when I'm reading this passage. How do you respond when the evil one tries to sidetrack you? He tries to sidetrack me. Just because I'm older, just because I've been in the ministry a long time, doesn't mean he doesn't try to sidetrack me in a lot of ways. I ask myself, am I living the Christian life the best right now that I've ever lived the Christian life before? Or are my best days days that are behind me? Am I continuing to grow and mature in the Lord, or am I sliding back? Let me remind you that any good work from the Lord is not just a good work, it's a great work, so do not come down. Let me be more specific. Maybe you've witnessed and shared the message of the gospel with some of your friends, your family members, over and over and over again, yet they've never responded. And in your heart, whether you want to admit it or not, you're ready to quit. You just don't see why you should keep on trying because you've tried so many different times. Let me respond to that. Don't quit. Don't do it. Maybe you've been harassed or maybe taken advantage of more than one time, than you, more than what you think you can take, and you're just telling yourself, it's time for me to give up. It's just time for me to give up. Don't do it. Perhaps you've drifted so far back away from God that you can tell yourself that you can never get close to God again. That just can't happen. It, that's not true. He says that you can come home. Let me tell you, heaven's laundry cleaning can take care of any sin, and there's no doubt about that. Anytime you take a step towards God, let me share with you what happens. He takes a step toward you, and any work done for God is a great work. Don't hold back, much less quit. The very best days of your life, in the name of the Lord, may be the, the steps that are right around the corner. Now I'm going to tell you a little goofy story. And the reason I'm telling you a goofy story is not just because I'm goofy, although anyone who knows me pretty well knows that that is a part of my personality. But I want you to remember what we talked about, and I hope I don't offend anybody with this, but I think if you can remember this in context, it'll help you remember some more important truth. Okay? This is a story. This isn't true. This is a story. If I tell you a story, if it's true, I'll tell you. If it's not, I won't. Okay? Here we go. I heard a story about a hunter who was chasing a bear. He was trying to shoot him. The hunter wanted more than anything else to have a winter coat. The bear finally was out of breath and stopped, and he started to talk. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to chase that. Okay. He said, let's talk about this. You want a fur coat, and I want a meal. Let's sit down, and let's discuss our situation. Well, the hunter had been chasing him for a long time, and he thought, well, that's a reasonable thing to do. So he sat down, and he talked to the bear. And guess what happened? Before long, they both got what they wanted. The bear had a meal, and the hunter wore a fur, fur coat. It just wasn't the fur coat that he expected he'd be wearing. You understand what I'm saying? Understand what I'm saying at even a deeper level. Say no to oh no, because it manifests itself in so many different ways. Don't ever step back from what Christ wants you to be and what Christ wants you to do. There's an old writer, an English writer, who I think was totally gifted of God. His name was John Greenleaf Whittier, and he wrote these words, and these words are potent to me. He said, the saddest words of tongue or pen are these, it might have been. It's not uncommon. I think, I, wish, I wonder if I could have been this, or I wonder if it could have been that. But in the Christian community, when it comes to spiritual things, don't have that be a title you look back down. Find out who you can be. Don't let these words apply to you. It may have been. Don't miss God's best. Don't come down from your place on the wall. Well, when the friendly attack didn't work, think the evil one's going to quit? Did he just quit with Jesus when he was trying to persuade Jesus not to do the things? No, he kept on coming at Jesus, and he's going to keep on coming at Nehemiah, and he keeps on coming at us. He's a relentless, isn't he? Look back with me at what we see in the, in the, in the life of Nehemiah in verses 5 through 7. He says, then the fifth time, the fifth time, Sambalan sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed, or it's a public or an open letter. 
in which was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you, he's speaking very directly to Nehemiah, you are about to become their king, and have even appointed the prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. He said, we're going to make sure that that happens. So come let us confer together. Now do you see what I do in these words? What were they saying in essence? They were saying, Nehemiah, since you didn't respond to our personal invitation, it was friendly, it was kind. You must be hiding something. Was he hiding something? No. They said, we know what it is and we're going to tell everybody. We're going to tell everybody that you came to Jerusalem not to try to build a wall but to start a revolution. You didn't want to build a wall. You want to be king. And if it doesn't, if that's not true, come back and talk to us for a little while so you can defend yourself for a while. What are we dealing with right now? What's one of the hardest things to take? What's one of the harshest things to take? Rumor. Did everybody tell a rumor about you that wasn't true? And you chased it down and it just broke your heart. And sometimes the people who listened, sometimes the people who shared you just couldn't believe would do that. Rumor. That's very clear. Look at verse 6. What does it say? It is reported among nations. Rumors are, rumors are cloaked like that, aren't they? Rumors are usually inaccurate or at least very exaggerated. What do we know about Nehemiah? Look at all he's gone through. He wasn't in this work for himself. Look what he gave up. He gave up that great job in Susa and he turned all, all, down all the extra food and extra money that they offered him as we saw in, in chapter 5. Yet this rumor, it must have hurt. Let me speak to that for a little while. All rumors hurt. All rumors hurt. Never minimize that truth. All rumors hurt. They not only hurt a lot, they hurt a lot, a lot. My little granddaughter, you see, sings with me a lot of times. We talk a lot of um, G-dad, that's granddad, to a little Avery talk. And I always say to her, how much does G-dad love you? And she says, a lot. And I say, a lot? And she says, no, G-dad loves me a lot, a lot. That's true. How much do rumors hurt? Not just a lot. It's hard, a lot, a lot. There's a lot of stuff floating around that's not good. Because that's such an important truth. I want to give you an illustration. Maybe you don't know. I know you know because you're an expert on the war between the states. Notice I didn't say the Civil War. That's an oxymoron. I recognize that. But the war between the states. If you don't know this, I hope it gets your attention. In 1887, a very terrible thing was done in this nation. 22 years after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, Guess what happened? They pried open his, co his coffin. You're going, what? I didn't know that. I've studied history my whole life, but I never heard that. Well, it did happen. Why? Why did they pry open his coffin? It's because a, a rumor was sweeping around the country that his coffin was empty. If you're as old as me, they tried the same thing with John F. Kennedy. Remember that? History tells us that a select group of witnesses observed that the rumor was false, that he, in fact, had died. He was actually in, his body was in the, in the, in the casket. And then they watched as the casket was not only open, but then resealed, and they resealed it with lead. You would think after that, people would be a little bit more cautious, right? But when people are starting to sin, it's easier to sin more. And when people are starting to sin, it's easier to sin deeper. So what took place in history? Well, 14 years later, his withered body was reviewed again. For what purpose? For the same purpose. Doubt had been implanted in some of the public's mind. Submitting Lincoln's family to this act was at best unfair. And at worst, what was it? It was very, very cruel. And that should not surprise us because sharing and hearing rumors is cruel. It's not just cruel, it's very cruel. Want to stop some rumors? I've got to chase this a little while because we live in a gossip world. Want to stop this? Well, there's some ways to do it. Let me give you a few suggestions that the Lord has placed in my heart to share with you. The first is this. If someone wants to spread information to you, but they are unwilling to share the specific source from which they got it, and they won't let you contact them, don't listen. Cease to participate and walk away immediately. Let me give you a second one. Ask them to support their evidence with useful facts. If there's no merit in sharing it, don't share. If the facts aren't facts, don't share. If the purpose is to tear down rather than build up or distort instead of encourage, cease participating immediately. Third, if approached and someone's telling you some sort of a rumor, Ask him this question, may I quote you on this? 
I've done that a few times as a pastor. I'd say, may I quote you on this? And all of a sudden, they don't want to talk to me about it much anymore. If people are unwilling to be quoted about something that they're reporting to be true, you know what? It's just like an anonymous letter. We do very well not to, not to pay much attention to and just walk away. And then fourth, if the other three don't work, let me openly share. The best way to approach somebody who just keeps on wanting to tell you something that's not true or something that's not healthy or something that's not healthy or something that's not godly, you know what you say? I don't appreciate hearing that. I've had to do that a few times in my life. That may sound harsh, but let me remind you something that's reality. If someone shares something about another person with you, it's only a matter of time and circumstance before they do the same thing to you with someone else. Why is that true? It's true because sin gives birth to sin. And guess what hurt does when it's aimed at somebody? It gives birth to more hurt. And if that's not convicting enough, think about it this way. If they want you to hear something bad about somebody else, they think that will make you happy to hear bad about something, somebody else. Think about what they're actually saying about your character, that you would want to hear bad things about other people. It's not much of a compliment, is it? may help to use the word, the acrostic, think. I think Gail's going to put that up for me. Think. T, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it important? N, is it necessary? K, is it kind? Any information that falls short of this test is unworthy to say and hear, especially for a follower of Jesus Christ. Now let's pop back to Nehemiah. He may have been tempted, but he didn't yield. Look with me how he responds to the rumor. Look at verses 8 and verse 9. He said, I sent him this reply, nothing or no thing, like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. I love these next words. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. What a great prayer. When we are tempted, when we are weary, when we are troubled, we do well not to look down. We do well not to look to the left. We do well not to look to the right. What do we do well to do? We do well to look up and to pray. And I love what he prayed. He said, Lord, strengthen my hands. And if you're like me, you say, I'll take that prayer, but let me add to it, Lord. Lord, strengthen my heart. Lord, strengthen my mind. I want to be a Christian. I want to be a follower of Christ in my attitudes and in my actions and in my words and my desires. Wow, one would think that he'd be wearing out at this time, but when assault number two didn't work, they moved on to assault number three. The evil one is relentless, isn't he? Spiritual warfare is absolutely real. Look what happens next. Look at verse 10. One day I went to the house of Shemiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Methabel, who was shut in his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. You see what's happening in this particular passage? A false prophet had been hired. For what purpose? To try to scare Nehemiah. How does he respond? Look at verses 11 through 13. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should he go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I like those next two words. I realized, I realized he woke up that God had not sent him, but he had been prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He had been hired to do what? To intimidate me. So I would commit a sin by doing this, by doing what? By running. And then would give me a bad name and discredit me. What a powerful reminder that as believers, we have not been given the spirit of fear. Nehemiah knew the last place to have fear was in the house of God. And amen to that. Nehemiah wasn't afraid of this man's words because he knew that he was not a man of God. I love what the Bible tells us when it gives us a warning in 1 John chapter 4 verse 1. It says, test or try the seers to see if they be from God. If somebody's really from God, the words they're going to speak are going to be words, whether they cite verses or not, that are words of life, words of freedom, words of power, words of love. To be able to do that, though, effectively, what do we have to be students of? We have to be students of the Bible. I saw the other day when I was looking at some of the information that's being put out across the world about people's time in the Bible is just becoming less and less and less and less. But to be able to do that just doesn't mean spending time in the Bible. We see another example in chapter 6, verse 14. When he went to the prayer, look what he prayed in verse 14. 
says to the Lord, remember Tobiah and Sambalat, oh my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who have been trying to intimidate me. What was he doing? He is giving those who are pressing him to God. Notice he doesn't say, Lord, change, change them. He's speaking about not just them, he's speaking about himself. He's saying, and grow me. Help me to be all I can be. What happened next? Look with me at chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. The wall was completed on the 25th of Ayul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence. Why? Because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Do you see what I do in these words? When all the enemies heard about the completion of the wall, they were the ones who were afraid. They were the ones who lost their self-confidence rather than Nehemiah and the builders. Why? Why was that true? Well, let me tell you why. It's because they realized this work had been done through the help of God. The work had been done through the help of God. The old song is very true. Let others see Jesus in you. Let others see Jesus in you. Keep telling the story. Be faithful and true. Let others see Jesus in you. People will not believe your words if they do not see Jesus in you. Well, when the wall had finally been completed, who got the credit? It wasn't Nehemiah, and it wasn't the people. It was God. Listen to the last part of verse 16. Our enemies lost their self-confidence. Why? Because they realized this work had been done with the help of our God. Wow. Wow. One might think at this particular point, the opposition would cease. But it didn't. When I think about that, I think about something I think we all do some well to think about for a little bit. It's amazing how hard the human heart, excuse me, how hard the human heart can become. I hear things today I never heard when I was a boy. I hear people say things that I can't believe they say. I see people talk to their children in ways. I think, you know what I would give for Two seconds, be able to share two seconds with my, my daughters, especially my daughters in heaven. Can't believe you should treat people like that. I hear people talk to their spouses in ways if anybody else did it, they'd punch them in the nose. I hear people do all kinds of things. It's amazing. If, if you get in an elevator, I try to say, see who says hi. I try to make everybody feel comfortable. I get gas, I get out and talk to the guy who's putting gas in the car. I try to be friendly and kind to everybody. But you know what? A lot of people don't. A lot of people don't. And once you start letting your heart get hard, boy, does it get hard. Look what happened. Look at verse 17 to 19. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah, and the replies from Tobiah kept on coming to them. For many in Judah were under oath to him, since he was a son-in-law to Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son Jehoanan, who had married the daughter of Mesalem, the son of Berechiah. Moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and telling him what I said. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. I know we're going on for a little longer maybe today, but you know what, I, I respectfully, I don't apologize for that because there's so many things in here I think we need to keep together in the same context because we're fighting not just a battle out there, we're fighting a war out there, and it is spiritual warfare, and we need to be prepared. I'll tell you what the Lord put in my heart when I read this particular passage. It reminded me that Jesus was tempted often when he was in the wilderness. And time and again, what do the Gospels tell us? They tempted the devil who not only tempted Jesus, he wants to tempt, to tempt us. Evil is resilient. It keeps coming. Evil is resilient. But know this, it is no match for God. It's no match for God. Now, how did Nehemiah respond? He said, all this happened to him. Look with me at chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, last verses today. After the wall had been rebuilt, and I set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and singers and Levites were appointed. We'll talk more about that down the road. I will put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hananiah, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel. We'll talk about that more down the road. But why did they do that? Because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most men do. What a great response. The man who was put in charge of guarding Jerusalem was chosen because he was a man of integrity and he feared God more than most men do. Don't 
fool yourself or let anyone else fool you. The, stronger, the strongest one who exists is the Lord, and he is stronger than anyone or anything else we will ever know or encounter. And to know that truth, we need to position ourselves to be like the man who was guarding Jerusalem by being a person, making a choice that no one can make for us but ourselves, making a choice to have integrity, making a, per a choice to, to revere the Lord and walk faithfully all of your days. Martin Luther, his life was not easy. Did he have some things I don't agree with happened in his life? Absolutely. But there came a time when he was really tested. It was during the papal tribunal. And when they threatened Martin Luther's life because they didn't like some of the things that he said, do you remember what he responded? He shouted out to the people who were threatening him, here I am, I can do no other. History tells us that during World War II, Winston Churchill spoke to the nation of England. They were in trouble. It looked like they were going to vanish from the face of the earth. And you may remember what he told them. He said, never, never, never give up. And I believe if he were speaking to us today in a spiritual context, he'd put it this way. Never, never, never give in and never, never, never give up. So when you feel like quitting on whatever you're working on, when you feel like quitting, do yourself a favor. Pause, pray, and ponder about what you, why you started what you did in the first place. Don't trade something great for something good, because if you do that, it will no longer be good. You have paid far too big of a price for it. We began today, starting our time together with the expression, when all is said and done, well, much more often than not, much more is said than done. That happens with so many people. If you're like me, you've had it happen to you. It certainly has happened to me. But let's not happen, let it happen anymore. Let me give you one other expression that came into my heart that I think is important. I have a friend here in town who always says to me, it is what it is, it is what it is, it is what it is. And I was walking around Lancaster and I saw a sign that had some words at the end of that and it went like this. It is what it is, but it becomes what we make it. Hmm, I think that's really good. But let me rephrase it a little bit. Let me make it more personal. It is what it is, but it becomes what we choose to make it through the power of God. So when you're trying to make a difference in the name of the Lord in this world, don't be so surprised if you have some challenges. They're inevitable. And the evil one is relentless. But don't give in, much less give up. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in this world. What are you saying, Pastor Ron? I'm saying this. Never give in. And even if you get knocked down, I've been knocked down. I've been knocked down so many times, I feel like I'm in a prize fight sometimes with him. He's hit me from so many different sides at so many different times, blindsided, and sometimes I recognize he's right there. Don't, don't, don't give in. And for heaven's sakes, don't, don't, don't give up. You will be so sad someday if you give up. Say no to oh no. In whatever form it shows itself, say no to oh no. And you know what? If you do that, your life will be better. If you do that, your family will be blessed. If you'll do that, you'll have a reputation that speaks long after you're gone. If you do that, when you get to heaven, you're going to say, let me see Jesus. And he's going to say, let me see you. Because you did well. Well done, thou good and faithful spirit person. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Make your life count here. That's the best way to be prepared for life and eternity. Say no to oh no in any form it comes. Have the Lord help you. Have the Christian family help you. Stay determined. Don't give in. And never, ever, ever give up. Amen? Amen. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we hear so much negativity anymore. It's just surrounding us. We hear people call each other names. We hear people encourage people to hurt other people. We hear people twist around the words of Jesus to make them say just the opposite of what they say. We hear people who say, oh, he's a Christian. Don't talk to him. He doesn't like anybody. 
Lord, we live in a tough world. You told us, Lord, that these words would be around and would be coming more and more plentiful as we get to the end of the age. But when we read Nehemiah, we see that four to 6,000 years ago, these same tactics were tried then. The fight back in our own humanity, we're going to lose. But the fight back through the power of God is different. Help us, Lord, to pay for, pray for our pure hands, pure heart, to practice more love, to not hoard a grudge, to not say unholy words, express unholy angers, or carry unholy thoughts. You have told us that when you set us free, we're free indeed. May we take you up in that offer. That way we can have peace. That way we can have joy. That way we can grow. That way we tell you thank you for all you've done for us. Father, we have such a short time on this earth when compared to eternity. Help us to remember what really matters. Help us to remember how much you matter. Help us to remember how much you want us to be all we can be and do all we can do in your name for our betterment and the betterment of the world. Help us to listen to you above all voices, even the voices in our own head and in our own heart. Father, may we say no to oh no in any form it comes, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.